everybody, it's Lon Sybin, and it's time for your weekly wrap up. And we've got a ton of stuff to talk about this week, so let's get into it. I want to first begin by thanking a huge list of new Patreon supporters MW, Brian Smith, Bob Angle, Martin Kozegi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, let me know. Uh, Vipul Patel, Jesse Smith, Craig Otten, Anthony Dodd, and we have two upgraders who went uh, from one funding level to a higher one Stephen Clark and Greg Cazezo, and then Gary A., who's been contributing via fan funding on the YouTube uh, page there, has also done it again. So thank, all, thank you all for uh, your continued support of the channel. We have a, I have a lot of cool stuff planned for this year, at least I'm hoping to get to it, and I really, really appreciate it because it is helping to uh, offset the declining uh, YouTube advertising dollars that we're seeing on this channel and many others, as well as just uh, helping to bring more stuff to the channel, like the things we looked at this week, including the Acer Chromebook R11, that is a two-in-one, and it's a, it can work as a tablet or as a regular laptop, and uh, that one's actually for sale on my lon.tv uh, store. You can go to lon.tv slash store for that one. Uh, we got the Kangaroo Plus Mini PC in, and this is the same Kangaroo PC that I love, a little two, what is it, a two gigabyte, uh, 32 gigabyte of storage uh, Windows PC. This is the four gigabyte version uh, with 64 gigs of storage. Now, the other one's still available, but this new one is kind of aimed at the enthusiast crowd. It lacks an operating system, so you do need to buy the Windows license if you want to go for it. By the way, all of these videos I'm talking about here are linked above, so you can check out anything you may have missed uh, over the course of the last week. But uh, definitely check out that Kangaroo review. I went over a couple of things that I didn't cover in the initial review, so it's not a repeat of the first one. It's actually new stuff, uh, some of it pertaining specifically to this one. Also, I kind of detail what, it, what the differences are between having two gigs of RAM on a mini PC versus four, and I think the results you'll, you'll probably find interesting, so definitely check that out. Uh, we also had a look at the Brother ADS 3000N scanner. This is less of a uh, consumer electronics product, perhaps, and more of a small office or uh, lawyer's office kind of device. But if you're looking to scan documents really fast and don't want to use a computer to do it, uh, this might be worth looking at. We were scanning uh, documents at uh, pretty high speeds right down to our NAS device in the basement. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and we looked at the Kingston HyperX Savage USB. This is a high-speed USB memory stick. This is the 128 gigabyte version. There's also a 256 gig version. Uh, so pretty quick little performance here. Not quite as high performing as a portable SSD might be, but if you don't want to have a cable and just want to have a stick that you can plug in that is uh, really fast, especially when you're reading data from it, this one is definitely worth checking out. I'm going to be doing a giveaway on this one. I've got two live streams uh, that I'm thinking about doing. Uh, and I'll give it this away on one of those live streams coming up. So definitely be on the lookout for that. You can sign up on my email list at lon.tv slash email to get a notification of upcoming giveaways and anytime we are going to do a live stream. And then we had something here that I think is going to be a big topic of ongoing discussion. This is the uh, Voyo V3 mini PC. And what's so significant about this is that uh, this has the Atom X7 Cherry Trail processor. Not many mini PCs are being made with this chip. It's, smart. it's actually noticeably faster than, at least on some of the benchmarks, than what we saw in the Kangaroo PC, which had the X5 processor in it. So it performs a little bit faster than the Kangaroo and many other uh, mini PCs. It has four gigs of RAM, as well as 128 gigabyte SSD that actually performs pretty well. So you know, really, this mini PC actually feels really speedy and quick. It really didn't feel like uh, there was too many compromises in using it for day-to-day -day kinds of tasks. Certainly not a gaming machine or a video editing machine, but uh, for a lot of general consumer use, it actually wasn't too bad. Now, I mentioned in the video that the Windows license was legit, and I'm beginning to have some doubts as to whether or not that's the case. Now, the first warning flag was the fact that when you turn it on for the first time, you don't go through the Windows onboarding process of setting up your username and password. Uh, it's got an account already made called uh, Voyo PC or whatever, and it logs you right into Windows onto that account. Uh, what was even more disturbing, though, is that uh, they had disabled user access control, and uh, that's, a, that's an issue for me and many others because it means that this PC has now uh, let down a lot of its uh, security guard, so to speak, and uh, things could happen to it. And what I did, though, just because I felt like, you know, I'm really not comfortable using this PC on an ongoing basis knowing that it, it had this issue, I decided to reinstall Windows by downloading it from Microsoft using the, uh, you know, the little creation tool to get the stick for the install. So I basically grabbed the 
uh, install file from Microsoft and installed it on there using that install file. Uh, Windows Home Edition, the same that was installed on there. What was interesting is that when I went to activate Windows, it told me that the code was blocked. Now I've reached out to Voyo. I want to get some of their uh, information and tech support on this just to make sure it's not me screwing something up here. Um, but I've got a bad feeling about this because we've seen this before on many of these Chinese made uh, mini PCs that they often do something to make it look like it's activated or just don't even activate it at all. And I think that is definitely a problem. So I'm going to work with the company a little bit and try to figure out what's going on here. But I think they may have cracked a copy of Windows onto it, which is why it showed as activated when I used it, but won't let me activate it now. Uh, usually the way I believe Microsoft works now is that they store uh, the hardware IDs for these machines in their databases so that when they come back to activate after a fresh install, uh, it passes down that activation without a product key. This one is getting blocked and I think it's going to be an issue. So let's see, we'll see what they say, but I am not confident about that. I'm going to probably update my, or at least make an update video about this when I find out more. I also wanted to point you towards a comment, even though this is before our Q&A segment, that I think is very relevant to this PC, uh, which talks a little bit more about user account control, UAC, and uh, Acrid Exit, who's a uh, frequent commenter and viewer of the channel, he uh, gave us a pretty good description as to what UAC does and why you don't want to disable it. And uh, I think uh, he makes some really valid points here, and he wasn't sure if anyone was ever going to read it, and I want to make sure people do, because uh, this is very important information, especially if you're considering buying this. In fact, I'm going to be linking this portion of the video uh, to the review in the interim until we have a full answer on this issue, and I thank um, Acrid here for uh, making such a good response here. I link to that comment at lon.tv slash UAC uh, so you can see it on the actual comment page and interact with him a little bit and ask some questions of him as well. So definitely be on the lookout for that. So some updates, lots of stuff today to talk about, like I said. Uh, we have the basement uh, moving along here. This was this morning. We started framing up the uh, the sheetrock here. So things are starting to move on the project. And this part's going to go pretty fast because this is a pretty, uh, well, maybe, I mean, it looks simple to me. I don't actually do the work. I pay somebody else to do it. But uh, this part's really simple. The hard part is going to be, we've got a lot of stuff hanging in the ceiling for the mechanicals in the house, like the water and the power and everything. So things have to get moved around. Uh, so that's going to slow them down a little bit. I'm trying to keep the ceiling as high as possible because I would like to do some stand-up stuff where you don't see the ceiling in the shot. So uh, we're going to be uh, you know, getting this easy part done, and then I'm sure the harder stuff might uh, take a little bit longer. But I think we're in good shape here. These, uh, these guys are ready to go. They're, uh, they showed up with a bunch of stuff today, and, I, and I'm really excited because it's just neat to see uh, work finally beginning on the new home for the channel. So uh, stay tuned. More to come. I'll do an update every week as we make significant progress on here. Now, this thing I'm really excited about. So you might recall that we uh, had a discussion of the retro VGS here on the channel a while back, and this was a Indiegogo campaign that uh, was, was going to develop a retro-styled game console that uh, would not emulate games, but would actually run the systems on an FPGA chip. And that project kind of didn't work out. They've got something new called the Coleco Chameleon, which I might uh, talk about in a future episode. But uh, what the, well, basically what was going to happen was instead of having software uh, emulate something, they were going to put in a chip that can be programmed to behave like the old processors did. And uh, presumably, or perhaps more than presumably, you could probably get a more accurate reproduction of how those old computers worked because you were actually simulating uh, how those chips worked. And it was kind of disappointing to see that project not really pan out because uh, this was a neat concept. And there was somebody that actually has had one of these things on the market for a while. This is a project out of Europe. It's called the Mist FPGA Computer. And this thing is uh, running Amiga software quite well. It runs the Commodore 64, ColecoVision, Apple II, uh, a bunch of other uh, systems as well. So I ordered one from Spain. I should have it in a couple of weeks, hopefully. And this will probably be one of our live streams. We might do a live stream about uh, setting this thing up and getting it to run some retro software. And uh, really what's neat about these FPGAs, again, is that we're not relying on software to emulate things. They're actually uh, programming the processor to run like these chips did on these old computers. So 16-bit computers and 8-bit computers uh, should actually run pretty well on here. I'll put a link down in the description to uh, the current list of compatibility. They even have Macintosh working, the old Macintosh working on here as well. So this is going to be a fun little project. Uh, it's just a neat way to look at uh, running classic computers. If you want accuracy, I think this might be a little bit more accurate than software emulators, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, there's some great discussion on the Atari Age forums comparing uh, FPGA versus software emulation, a really interesting discussion there too. So there's no easy answer as to which one is best, but I just think it's kind of neat to be able to program hardware to make it work like old stuff. And this is going to be 
a fun little project. So when that comes in, I will let you know what that's all about. So Q&A time. First of all, I want to thank everyone for the comments we had last week about my production quality and some of the things about that. And yes, I, you know, the background will change when we move downstairs, but it was good to hear that people generally liked uh, the way the channel looks because it does look a little bit different and a little less fancy perhaps than some other stuff out there. I do eventually want to go to 4K, not because um, you know, I want to make it difficult for people to watch, but um, because I think at some point in the future, everyone's going to be watching 4K and my content tends to live a long time. So I want to make sure that there's no barrier to people watching because they don't, they see a 4K video from one person and not one from me. So just to keep myself competitive, I'll eventually go to 4K. The good news about YouTube is that it creates a bunch of different versions of videos. So if you can't play back 4K content, uh, usually your client will default to uh, the lower resolution for your device. So it shouldn't impact anything when it happens. But uh, until my TriCaster is 4K compatible or there's an inexpensive TriCaster that is, uh, we'll be at 1080p for the foreseeable future. So that's just, just wanted to clarify that for everybody. So let's get into a really uh, hardball question here from Vince. He wants to know, because I know this will create a debate out there, uh, do I prefer Mac OS X or Microsoft Windows? And if I had to choose to use one for the rest of my life, which would it be? Uh, the answer on that one would probably be OS X. I use it uh, day to day for almost everything that I do. However, I do use Windows a, a quite a bit in other parts of my life. So uh, my, my day job, I use Windows there for just about everything I do. Uh, and I also, of course, have my gaming PC because gaming on the Mac is coming along, but it's still nowhere near as good as it is on the PC. So I, I am definitely uh, living in Windows, but I probably spend 80% of my life on the Mac uh, because it just works the best for everything that I do. I think I talked about maybe last week or the week before uh, why I use Mac more on the channel for production than Windows, partly because of Keynote uh, that I mentioned in Final Cut Pro. But I just, you know, I've had, I just had good luck with the Macs. I mean, the you know, some of them break when you first get them, but after they uh, get up and running, they tend to work for a very long time. And uh, my MacBook Pro that I bought almost four years ago uh, is still cranking away. The keyboard finally is dying on it. I have to get that fixed, but um, it's been great. I haven't had to reinstall anything. I mean, it's running with the same exact you know, OS installation. I've upgraded it, of course, but I haven't had to reinstall anything from scratch on that thing for four years, and it still uh, functions just as well as it does now. So I think OS X is a really mature operating system. And one of the things that Apple can do that Microsoft sometimes can't is that uh, for whatever reason Mac users are okay with Apple just obsoleting stuff and making old software not run on the current hardware and it's happened over and over again where things just like if you were to download an OS 10 application from like seven or eight years ago it just won't run right now uh, whereas on Windows they usually tend to work for almost you know back to the beginning of time and it's just because Apple's consumers just are okay with that um, I don't know if I'm always okay with that but that's just the nature of being a Mac user is that they just get you to buy more hardware over time. And maybe that's why it's a little bit of a different experience for me. But I do like Windows. I think Windows 10 is a good uh, step in the right direction. Windows 7 was great. I still run that on my virtual machine, but um, I just am a Mac user. And I, and I wasn't always, but I am uh, primarily a Mac user now. So don't hate me, but I like Mac. So let's move on to the next question here. Ken Market wants to know, uh, do I, how far ahead do I plan? A week, a month, or several months? Uh, my planning... I, I kind of call it the shiny object planning, and you'll see this when we get to the uh, coming up this week segment here. So I, generally, I have things that I want to get done. I have an ongoing list of things that are on my docket to shoot. And uh, what happens a lot of times is that something shiny will appear, and I will then change the schedule to accommodate the shiny object. And the reason I do that is because, as you all know, about 90% of my traffic comes from search, and I'm beginning to get very well ranked in the YouTube search engine. So if there's a hot new product that comes out, especially from a name brand, I usually hustle to try to get that one up first when it comes out because that means I'll get more traffic in the long run. So uh, that will often knock things out of contention when that happens. And then like we have with the Voyo PC, I ordered that from Geek Buying. It takes forever to get over here from China. So you know you never know when those things are gonna show up, but I knew a lot of viewers were interested in it. So I kind of just said, all right, we're gonna push a couple things off over here. We're gonna get this Voyo thing shot. So that's typically how I work is um, you know the shiny object theory. And generally, if I start hearing people asking, I forget like two or three people, asking for the same thing, I'm going to move pretty quick to try to get that in there. And that includes the uh, Acer Windows uh, R11. I'm, I know about it. I'm, I know a lot of you were disappointed that they thought I was doing that when I talked about the Chromebook. We had a bunch of people asking about the Chromebook and a bunch of people asking about the Windows version of the R11. So we'll be getting both in. But that's a good example of that. You know, I'll hear some, some scuttlebutt and I move quick to get it in there. So yeah, I generally don't plan too far ahead. 
Um, I do plan ahead on the, on the live streams and that sort of thing and things that I kind of want to do, but uh, generally I stick to whatever is hot out there right now and shiny, so that's how I do that. I also wanted to talk briefly about the disclosure policy on the channel. So what's been great about this since I started doing these longer disclosures, I've, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people, some really constructive feedback too, and I just wanted to kind of clarify you know, why I'm doing it. You can go back and watch the uh, FameBit video that I did to talk about why I decided to adopt this policy, for, for first of all. Um, I don't think it takes all that much time to go a little bit more in detail as to what these relationships are with companies because um, you know generally I buy most of the stuff that I review on the channel. However, uh, you know more and more brands are beginning to recognize that I'm that I exist and may be worth. Uh, sending some products to me, especially if they think the products are good, uh, so they want some coverage on the channel. And, and it's always easier for me to have something sent to the show uh, to review versus having to go out and buy it and resell it and deal with all the administrative duties involved with that. So um, usually what I ask of these brands when they send stuff to me is that uh, I just want to be able to send it back to them, as, you know, just keep it as a loaner. Uh, but oftentimes they're going through firms that don't work that way and I have to keep it, which is, you know, believe me, I don't, I don't like keeping things because I have no room for them and I have two com three computers that I use that I'm quite happy with. So having more and more computers doesn't, doesn't help the situation any. And I also have some issues with doing giveaways on the more expensive computers because uh, with those, I, there's tax implications for you and for me in giving away things that cost more than $600 here in the United States. So typically I usually donate those to a school or I find some uh, use in my day job for them on those devices. So that's kind of how things come in. But I feel like it's important for people to know exactly where I'm at on this stuff. And uh, in that way, I think it takes a little bit of time to explain it because some things are a little bit more complicated, like how the Amazon Vine program works, for example. And uh, again, knowing that 90% uh, of my traffic are people that have never seen one of my videos before, I think it's important when people come to me to know exactly where things stand. So as subscribers, you're going to hear uh, me repeat myself a lot in these disclaimers, and I'm trying to come up with a, a way of saying it that flows a little bit faster. So you're gonna see it kind of tighten up and get more concise over time because what I do, actually, this is kind of crazy, but I do actually go back and watch the disclaimer on a bunch of different videos and I'm seeing how I react to it, trying to put myself in your shoes and I'm, I'm gonna continually kind of uh, tweak it a little bit to get it to a point where it can get the point across in as little words as possible. Uh, hopefully fewer words than I'm even saying right now. So uh, bear with me on it, but I did appreciate the feedback. The good news for me at least is that um, a, major like a large majority of the feedback I've received both in public on the comments th th uh, thread, uh, both through the uh, Patreon feedback I've got as well as through other channels as well, including direct emails to me, uh, I would say it's probably 85% positive about the disclaimer policy, so that was a good thing. Now, I did want to address one thing related to disclaimers, uh, and that has to do with whether or not I could just put the disclaimer in the description, and actually that is what kind of started this whole thing, was that you can't. Um, and this is a, a snippet from the FTC's rules on uh, proper disclosures for bloggers and YouTubers. And the reason why you can't just put it in the description is for a couple reasons. One is that, as you know, there's a, a fold on the description where you have to click more to get more information on the video. So for a lot of people, they don't go in and look at that section and they don't click on it and they'll never see it. A lot of times mobile devices, depending on the size of the screen, may not have the description up on the page. And then I often watch uh, on my Android TV, on my Nvidia Shield TV, that's my primary YouTube device that I watch on, I don't get anything. I don't get uh, annotations. I don't get cards on that, nor do I get video descriptions either beyond maybe that first uh, two sentences. So, um, you know, I think it's very important to follow the guidelines here. And actually what I'm doing, especially when something comes to the show for free uh, and they don't want it back, I'm actually following the law and many people on the platform are not. And that is why it's annoying to some people because I actually have to follow the law and, uh, and I'm trying to get others to do the same thing. So that is uh, the kind of the rundown on the disclosures. But I do appreciate the feedback on that and keep it coming too because it is helpful in helping me kind of hone how I'm going to do this moving forward. But I definitely want to keep that as part of our routine here. I think it's important even for you as subscribers to know uh, when something comes in, uh, how that works. And you'll see in a minute too that we're gonna start getting more sponsorship on the channel and I wanna make sure we're very clearly delineating how all of these things work. So let's talk about this week, shall we? Uh, we have a couple of things coming up. We still have that Lenovo Y900. In fact, it's behind me somewhere. We're gonna get to that this week. A uh, really nice little machine from Lenovo. They lent that to the show. Everything, by the way, from Lenovo, they lend to me, which is the best relationship because it gets sent here, I review it, and I send it back, and if I don't get it back to them in 30 days, they come after me. So uh, they are very diligent about getting their stuff back, which is what I like about them. Um, we also have that uh, mini PC with the, uh, the stick with the Ethernet port. We are gonna get to the, the Azul PC. Don't worry, it's coming up. 
And then I'm gonna have a really good tail, hopefully this will get resolved this week, on my uh, ongoing issue with the Surface Book. And um, you know, I'm, I'm just so frustrated right now with Microsoft over their customer service. And it, it's, this story is so weird, and it's gonna be great when it's finally all resolved because there's some uh, interesting stuff they're doing in their customer service department. And, and actually, it's not all bad, um, but it, it, it was in my case, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, you might not notice it, but the Surface Book is slightly bent there. Um, when I sent it in for repair to deal with some issues that it was having, it came back with a dent on it. So that, that, that port there looks a little crooked. It's because somehow it got damaged in between me and them, and that's what I've been trying to get resolved here. So I was initially going to sell this thing because I really don't have a use for it. I'm not as crazy about it as I was before. I can't even do that now. So I'm working on uh, getting this resolved with Microsoft, and they were supposed to get it resolved last week, and I'm still waiting. So we'll see what happens with this, but it'll be a very interesting customer service story. Now, I have a picture of a 35 millimeter film negative up because uh, this is going to be an upcoming series I'm doing on photos. So I, I'd asked on my Facebook page a couple of weeks ago about how people are organizing photos and whatnot, and I've been really interested in taking a lot of negatives that I have. I, I have like boxes and boxes of photo negatives going back, you know, decades, and uh, scanning those in and making them into digital photos. And around the time I was thinking about this, I was approached by somebody uh, from a company that I've known uh, and we worked out a sponsorship arrangement for this. And this is going to be a good example of how sponsored content I would like to see working on this channel, where I'm not just pitching something. We're actually uh, doing something of value and integrating a product into it. So that's what we're going to be doing uh, with this series. So we're going to talk about, uh, in this first instance here, getting photos into your computer. Uh, and then we'll have other things about organizing photos and everything else. And so some of these videos will be sponsored. Some won't be. Uh, there may be different companies involved with it, depending on what we're talking about. But it's going to be kind of an ongoing series of uh, archiving old photographs in a efficient and inexpensive way and I think it's gonna be kind of fun so uh, be on the lookout for that I think we'll have this up and up uh, this week on the channel and I'm going to be delineating uh, the sponsored uh, stuff a little bit differently than my regular video so you know right now on my most of my review videos we've got a yellow band on the side uh, the sponsored content will be like a light green and the wrap-ups are gonna have this uh, purplish bluish thing that's on this video here so you'll definitely know which ones are sponsored but uh, my hope Hope is that most of these sponsored content videos will be something where you can gain some value out of it. And I think back to the WD stuff that we were doing where we were you know, showing how features worked as opposed to me just pitching stuff. I'm, I don't like being a pitch man, so I really want to add value to uh, whatever we're talking about. I think this will be a good example of that. So I'd love to hear your feedback when it's posted about that. So I've been rambling on long enough. So if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon and make a monthly contribution to the channel. Uh, you can also do a one-time contribution on YouTube fan funding at lon.tv as Gary A. did. You can also uh, donate kind of passively just by shopping on Amazon uh, by going to lon.tv slash Amazon and that will take you into Amazon through my affiliate link and then anything you buy on their platform while you're there will count towards the channel and your pricing won't change at all. So it's a very good and passive way if you're a frequent Amazon shopper to help out the channel. So lots of cool ways to help there. And we've got so many different ways to connect also. We got that email list I talked about, lon.tv slash email. You can also go over to uh, lon.tv slash Facebook if you wanna make a Facebook uh, hello to me, uh, lon.tv slash forums, and of course, lon.tv slash Reddit our latest uh, invention here. We've got a lot of moderators on the channel. I think just about every user of the Reddit page is a moderator right now, which is fine. I'm, I'm looking forward to building up a community there. I am uh, popping in and lurking there. I haven't communicated all that much on the Reddit channel, but it's been great to see people putting uh, links up and everything, so I, I greatly appreciate that. And if you are a Reddit user, go in there and give those folks some karma because they need it. So thank you all for helping me get that set up. So that's gonna do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I think I felt like I've been rambling today, but if I, if I was, let me know. And if I wasn't, let me know either way because feedback is always critical to uh, keeping this ship running. And we've got plenty of fun stuff this week. Thank you all for watching and we'll talk to you soon. This is Lon Seibin, thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporter Shabib. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.